Okay. Um, this is my, my talk on teamwork. Uh, my name is Michael Fend, Mike Fend. Um, I'm quite excited to, to kind of get into this topic. It's something that's been kind of a passion project of mine now for a few years. Um, the way this will work is I will, uh, I have a lot of slides prepared and mostly what I'll do is uh, be running off those slides. So hopefully you won't be seeing too much of me and mostly just looking at the, the slides I prepared. Uh, but at any point, if you have any questions, since we are such a, a relatively small group, I really urge you just uh, to either write in the chat window and Tetevik uh, will help me. She's my awesome, awesome assistant. Um, or just turn on your microphone and, and give me, um, you know, give me, give me some sort of notification that you have a question on something, but I'll try and be disciplined and periodically stop and see if people have any questions. So with that, I'm going to start sharing my screen. And of course, okay, so can everybody see my screen at the moment? Perfect. All right, so this is a talk uh, that I've been working on and um, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited uh, to explain everything and really have not just me talking at you, but really having an open dialogue. Um, so before we go into the, the details um, of how this is all gonna work, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, before I moved to Munich, I was a field engineer for five years. So I traveled around the world and installed uh, GPS equipment and atmospheric equipment to monitor plate tectonic movement and also uh, monitor atmospheric changes. So the picture you see on your screen right now is when I responded to the 2015 uh, earthquake in Nepal, the 7.8 magnitude. So there, I was there for almost three months responding, um, but most of the time I spent working in the Caribbean or Central America and Latin America and there, this is when I first kind of started developing my skills of, of landing in a country, meeting an in-country local contact, and just having to work really long hours and, and, and create, create a bond, but also accomplish this goal. And, you know, how do we, how do we work as a team in this, uh, in this kind of harsh or, or challenging environment? Um, then after five years of being a field engineer, I decided to go back and get my master's. So I moved to Munich uh, at Tum and started with a, my master's in management and uh, quickly, very quickly got roped into this Unternehmer Tum ecosystem and um, started trying to start three startups. Uh, ultimately, they were all unsuccessful, but at the same time, I saw these, these really interesting parallels between being in the field with a small group of people and having a goal and and trying to you know trying to accomplish something, and then doing the same thing on the startup. You have limited resources, you have a small team, everybody has their speciality, and then you're trying to accomplish something great. So uh, through these processes, I've I've learned a lot of lessons on how to communicate with people, how to how to change my perspective, how to um, you know, go forward with everything and, and be a better team member and how to select better team members. Um, so this is kind of my, my experience at the, at the, at the moment. Um, as we're going through, uh, we've got a couple of main topics we're gonna cover. So first we're gonna talk about the team design um, then we're going to talk about the ideation phase and kind of the ideal situation and then what usually happens, it's common pitfalls. Then we're going to talk about uh, what happens inside the brain when we're trying to make decisions as a group. Um, 
And then uh, I have just a couple of, or after the, the brain session, we're going to be going into a breakout session. And that's where you all will be able to kind of reflect on what's been said so far and collaborate with everybody in the session. Then I'll have, I have a couple of pro tips uh, that have, I've kind of just picked the very few since I'm limited on time. And finally, just uh, the power of perspective is how I'm going to round it out. And since it is a Friday night, and I know all of you just can't wait to get back onto your Netflix account, in the bottom right-hand corner on the slides, there's a little meter. Once we get onto the right-hand side, that's when I'm done talking and you guys can uh, be free and not have to listen to me babble on anymore. So far, are there any questions? Okay. So, in the chat window, I'm curious, if you're looking for a team member, what are some of the traits that you're looking for in that team member? This is, this is something that we ever, we're meeting a new team at a group or at our, in our organization or company, or we're trying to form anything for the startup ecosystem. A lot of times you fail. This is a reality. And we're constantly trying to find new team members. So what exactly are these traits that we try and identify in others? So if you put it in the chat window. Do we have any responses so far? Yeah, we have um, reliability, credibility, authenticity, trust, listening skills, common values, um, and shared vision, communication skills. Interesting. Okay, that's super interesting because some of them I'll talk explicitly on this slide. Um, and some I'll mostly be talking about actually on the next slide. Um, the three things that I found from personal experience uh, and then also from going into the research, um, I've read a few papers now on the subject. What does the academic literature have to say on this topic? And the first thing that I, I look for in somebody on a team is, is autonomy. Somebody who, you know, I think they suddenly said reliable. For me, when you're autonomous, you're also a reliable person. If we as a group come up with a, de a decision and we've set out the roles, I'm confident and I trust that this person can be able to do it. Or if they can't, they, within reason, they can ask for help. Um, you know, I've been on teams before on, on startups where somebody comes up and they're just constantly asking me questions. And when they're constantly asking questions that are easily Googleable, you know, that, that you're talking about the, the, the bandwidth of, of a team potentials. Now you have two people trying to solve this one problem and it, you're just wasting uh, human, human work power, essentially. So you really have to be, uh, I look for somebody who's autonomous. Uh, the next thing that I look for as well is, is flexibility. Um, when somebody is actively being flexible, you know, this, this allows the team to be dynamic with the plans. Um, you know, planning, whether it be going into the field for a two and a half month uh, campaign in a country or trying to change the next startup, the plan is gonna change and you're really gonna have to just sit there and, and be flexible with, okay, this is no longer important. We have to go in a new direction. And so that flexibility for me is also quite important. Um, and it also comes with that de-ideation phase as well. If somebody's too stuck in their own ways, this is the way that I want it to be, um, then it just tends to, it tends to, um, it, it holds things back. It holds back potential of, of really being able to push forward and being dynamic, which is your one strong advantage of being a team, of being a small team versus a corporate, is being dynamic. Finally, I look 
for all the Lisa Simpsons in the world. I look for the high achievers, the people who are coming out and they've just, they really want to do something. They, they want to produce quality work. They're trying for quality work. You know, maybe it doesn't happen every time, but it's the person who's really going out there and, and trying to do something unique, something, uh, you know, when they put their name on, on their work, it means something. Um, yeah, they may be very quick in how they're doing things because that's just the way it goes in a startup or in the field. If you don't have all the niceties and you don't have a workshop right next to you, you kind of have to be quick and dirty and just get it done. That doesn't mean that it's high quality. It, it still means that they're high achieving. They're just, they're prioritizing speed over quality in that kind of, that time. And there is a time and a place where you need to change that heuristic. What are you going to prioritize? So being a high achiever doesn't necessarily mean high quality all the time. Anybody have any questions on this so far? No okay. questions. Ah, do we have one from Mark, I see? So, okay, it's, uh, it's a nice uh, list of items you're looking for, but how do you assess the people? Like, do you um, talk to them? Do you look at them? Do you um, uh, watch them as they work and then make your math in, in your, in your back head or mm -hmm. how do you do it? Yeah. So what I look for is body language and what they're saying. This is kind of my biggest thing, but I won't go too much into body language because that's a whole gigantic topic in itself. I look for body language and I look for authenticity. When somebody says something, does that match with their body language? A uh, little secret about myself. I'm terrible with languages. So when I was flying around all these countries, I couldn't understand what people were speaking. So what I did instead is I was just watching people's body language and I was trying to follow the conversation just by how people are moving. You know, what, are their, what are their eyes doing? What is their face doing? What is their nose and their, their, and their eyebrows doing? Which way are their feet pointing? By paying attention to body language and making sure that that, you know, that matches, um, that, that's really what is helpful for me. Uh, now in terms of the other part of that is I just try and spend time with them, either going out, we have a, a drink or something, or you're, I, luckily at Untenimatum, we have so many uh, pitch events, or you just, you kind of just see the same people and over and over, and you see what people are accomplishing. And so you kind of look over your shoulder, like that's somebody I could see myself working with. Um, so it, getting exposure, you, you don't want to overcommit initially. You, you want to, one thing that I will do going forward is I'll always have a trial phase with any startup that I, that I try and go with, with anybody, because you can talk and you can say, and somebody can put on a good spiel, put on a good show, but really once you get down to working together and setting that trial time, that's when you really get to see. So just like entrepreneurship, experiment, run an experiment for a quick time, see if it works out. And if it doesn't, then just say, Hey, you know what? I, I've got other priorities and I need to move on or do something else, but make it uh, low cost in terms of your time and investment. Okay, so moving on to team anatomy. This one, uh, two, two things were already mentioned in the trust or in the, just give it away, uh, in the chat. And I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of here in my ideal world where reality never comes in, um, what I like to look for in team members is the first and first thing that I look for is, are they different from me? So, you know, if I'm a square head and I need to be making sure that I have no squares that I'm looking for, um, or, you know, I'm looking for hexagons, I'm looking for star stars, I'm looking for in the field, you know, a lot of times for these long days, I'm looking for a local driver who has a government vehicle so we can get past any weird uh, things that are going to pop up. I'm looking for the local content who knows not only where to eat and where to sleep, knows the language, um, but just, you know, has that, that unbelievably valuable asset of being a local. And myself, you know, I came in with some unique equipment and had my own expertise as a, a field engineer. Um, the same thing with a startup, you know, you need like a, a manager, you need maybe a front-end developer, a back-end developer, maybe somebody in, in finance, um, 
these are all, you really need to have this diversity. Um, the next thing that I look for uh, that it is in an ideal team is, is this communication. It's this, this trust, this how are we interacting from day to day. When we're in this, this trust cycle, um, and we've had a few um, talks during this conference that be true, trust is, is for me kind of what is the, the biggest thing? What is this? I hate saying it, but it's totally true. It's how do you create this safe space? The safe space of I feel that I can communicate truly towards you. And I, I, I know that you're going to give me um, a true and honest feedback. So this, this trust in terms of team anatomy, I think, is, is quite valuable. Um, oh, do I have a question? So a, a flash on my screen here. OK. No, we have no questions. OK, something weird. Um, so the next thing I look for in a, in a startup team or in small teams in general is, is passion. Um, when, I mean, just look at the numbers. How many startups fail? The numbers, depending upon which study and what heuristic and how you slice the numbers, the end number, it's, it's just ridiculously high. I mean, we're talking above 80%. Uh, usually fail after five years. So, meaning they're no longer a company. Um, so for me, this is a clear sign by looking at the data that this is a difficult task, this is a difficult thing to do. And, you know, it's, you're gonna really need that motivation to, to push through. Now, to contradict myself a little bit, you know, does every single person in the group have to have strong passion for the project? Not necessarily. I've been in situations where one person was so passionate that that, that passion is, is, is more uh, infectious. It, it bleeds over to other people. Um, so, it, I mean, at least the majority of the people have to be quite passionate about the problem and have to communicate that passion often and regularly especially when you're up one or two or three in the morning and you've got to be up again at, uh, at 6 a.m. To, to get to a conference or get to a flight or to get to whatever. The last thing that was mentioned already is that shared vision. That shared vision is so important. You're, you're such a small group and, and yes, you have to be all working on individual tasks. You have to be separated, but that they, those tasks all have to be working towards the same direction. And it's, it's so much easier for me to sit up here and like most of the things I say, it's so easy for me to come up here and just talk about it. But it's in reality, it's really hard to get people all truthfully on the same page and all moving in the right direction. So out of this, does anybody want to contribute and say which out of these four traits of an ideal team do they think is their favorite or most important and why? I'd love to, to open it up a little bit. You can simply unmute yourself and talk. Um, for me, it's uh, actually communication, trust, <clears throat> because if you're able to communicate, you can assess how different you are from the others. You can um, understand whether there is passion or not, and what's the reason maybe passion is, is missing. And last but not least, you can speak about your vision and mission and align on that. Um, but if you can't communicate, um, especially in remote conditions, I think it's becoming difficult. However, all of them are super important from my perspective. Thank you. I, I'm biased because I completely agree, but I'm curious, does anybody disagree with, with Mark and myself? Is there anybody who thinks perhaps the, the, the direction is the most important? 
There is a comment from Chris. Uh, yeah. It says that the connection calls the direction and thought the patient can change. So, Chris, if you would, would like to elaborate on this a bit, you can also unmute yourself and talk. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, I would say to myself, uh, Chris, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's, it's, it's not Chris. Uh, I think he's, he's not giving any uh, voice. Uh, that's Christian. What I wanted to mention is um, when I saw your previous slide, I was a little bit unhappy um, because I missed very much anything related to trust. You know, autonomy, flexibility, high achiever has nothing to do with trust. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that you put it on this slide, um, that you want to trust in your, in your, in your team. Very important, very good. Um, the one thing I want to point out is that for different from me, I like that idea. And um, it's, it's, I, I was surprised to see it here. It's very good. Um, I would like to build on that a little bit and say, not only different from you as a team lead, but different from each other. So you need a colorful team. Uh, it's not, if you're a square, you just have to get a lot of uh, stars. Uh, now you should see uh, to get a star, a rectangular shapes, a circle, whatever. Mixed teams are getting better results and uh, better solutions. I, I, I completely agree. Um, I, you know, I, one of my last startups, we had, I think it was five managers and one uh, amazing programmer. And when you have five managers on a team, guess what? It doesn't work. Um, we all had the same skill and we were all just in our own hamster wheel running the same direction and we weren't effective in moving it. Even when I'm a field engineer, uh, from a cultural standpoint, um, you know, we, for whatever, I think they just wanted to get out of the office. If we had a seat available in the truck or in the, in the SUV, boy, those seats were full hundred percent of the time. And, you know, as it's great, I enjoyed, it was wonderful catching a, a cultural exchange. At the end of the day, there's a project density where there's just too many people in the car and it, they're not adding any value. Um, so on a fun aspect, yeah, that's fun and fine, but on a terms of like actually getting things done, it's a totally different situation. So I completely agree. And, and, yeah, I'm sorry that I had to delay gratification, but trust is very much important to this. And the rest of my talk kind of talks about and dives into trust and how to build trust. Okay, so next slide. Uh, I'm curious. So we're going to talk about ideation here. And does anybody see anything about this that could be, does anybody see anything about this and you can just open your mic that's good about this photo? If, if there's anything that conjures up a good feeling, great. If you see anything wrong with this photo, um, I'm curious. So if we can get one or two contributions, that'd be great. I think it's a great photo because it's <clears throat> containing a picture instead of words. And I think drawing in terms of ideation is um, a key asset. It's not about whether the picture is beautiful or able to win a prize, but that you can express what you mean by, by drawing, because then you're using your brain just in a different, different style compared to just writing down bullets. And uh, people will be able to remember that picture and therefore it sticks. Uh, I, I agree with that drawing, but in that picture, there is one big idea like overlapping with a lot of small ideas. And I think especially in ideation, is, it is important that all of the ideas get equal space to be explored. And here we have like one big idea, um, making shadows, making a shadow over the others. Is there anybody else? Because to build on that from what Lenny just contributed, that's exactly what I see. Only I see it slightly different. Yes, I, I really do think that 
drawing pictures is amazing. But when it comes to a team aspect, what the thing that stuck out to me when I saw this, this, this poor internet stock lady photo is the direct attachment that she had with her idea. Because this is a humanistic mistake that a lot of us make is when we come up with ideas, it, it, we get so, uh, we, we see them so clearly because they came from our brain and we can visualize them and then we get attached to them. And it's this attachment of, hey, this is my idea. Um, they can really start holding people back. Because in a team, you know, what happens when somebody else comes in and, and says, oh, I, oops, I have an idea. And this, the, you know, this other team maybe comes in and says, but look at my idea. It's bigger, better, faster. And then what happens when corporate bro Jad, Chad over here comes in and says, but look at my ideas. They're even bigger. What, what's actually happening, and there's been studies on this that are fascinating, is during an ideation phase, especially in the beginning when you're in, in a startup, people don't really know that you're going into the unknown. Nobody knows what you're doing. If, if, you, if it had been done before, you probably shouldn't be doing that startup in the first place. So in this context here, what's actually happening is a social hierarchy and you're, you're, fighting, you're fighting for positioning actually. And it has nothing to do with the idea. The idea is this weird thing that probably isn't gonna be right. I mean, name me a startup where at the very first ideation session, people sat down and said, okay, here's the idea. This is perfect. This is how we're gonna solve the problem. And this is how we're gonna execute. And then that idea went and became the next student court. Never, it never happens that way. Uh, from a different perspective as being a field engineer, I would sometimes spend months or up to a year planning a, a, a trip to a country, going all over the country and installing sites, fixing this, doing this, doing that. Not once in five years did I make a plan and a schedule and then actually execute that plan to that way. Absolutely every single time, something critical failed. So this, this attachment to our ideas or attachment to the plan and not going back to being flexible, not being flexible enough to incorporate new data and adjust and pivot, this is what can also be holding back a team. Um, and this is where if you don't have that strong connection with the team, this is where things people start to fall off a little bit. So, in an ideal situation, what I like to see is obviously there's gonna be, at some point, there's gotta be that singular direction. There's gotta be that singular idea that, get, that gets uh, reached. And with this singular idea, if we were to take our, our spectrometer, um, looking at how this light and this idea was formed, we'd notice, hey, this, if we're looking through the prism here, there's all of these different layers and all of these different layers came from, um, you know, all of these, oops, for different participants. And when you have these, these, these different layers, it's really important to, to make sure that, that everybody's contributed. On this, I really think of a concept that comes from jazz, jazz music. So bear with me, we're getting outside the, the geometry analogy for a minute. There's a concept called trading eights. So in jazz, a lot of times it's improvised, much like a startup. And when they're performing, you've got this, you know, maybe you've got a, a, um, a stand-up bassist and they come in, they come in for two bars and they do a solo. They add their piece, they, they make part of their musical conversation and then they step back. And then all of a sudden the drummer comes in, the drummer's doing their jig, doing their thing and does that for a period of time and then steps back and then maybe a saxophonist. This is the same thing of how it should be when in you're in an ideal situation. When you're in an ideal ideation phase, everybody's contributing. Yes, even the introverts, they have to talk. There's no other way to, to, to do this. And then all of a sudden you'll get to this, 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 this one idea that you're gonna get to. But this is an ideal situation and we as humans have faults. Again, this is nice if this happens, it's rare if it does, but most often it doesn't happen like this. Most often what, uh, most often what happens is, is all of a sudden 
you know, we, we go to, we come up with this idea and there was some, usually at least one person who was against said idea. Maybe they were thinking it differently. Maybe from, from a, a star's point of view, the way they're seeing the world, they see it differently. And when, when, an, and when a team goes in a direction that's opposite to the, the mind frame or the point of view from another member, instantly, I don't care who you are, there's gonna be a little bit at the very least of you kind of going, ah, dang it, I didn't win this one. There's gonna be a little dent in your ego. Um, and this is when I find it it's extremely, like, as soon as you make an idea, you have to pause and everybody on the team should be aware of who didn't get chosen or their idea didn't get chosen, so to speak. Because this black sheep phenomenon, this is when you need to make sure you really make an extra effort to bring that person in. Because a lot of times, and I've seen it on a startup, Somebody's like, yeah, I agree. We should totally go in that direction. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And meanwhile, in the back of their head, even though they're saying, yeah, this is all good, I'm gonna be back here and I'm gonna do something else because, because they didn't go with my idea, I'm now offended, hurt, or whatever. So on one end, that person should be able to take criticism. They should be able to go and be flexible. But the other idea, even as someone like myself, I try and be pretty flexible, it still stinks if you go in somebody else's direction. Still, there's again, there's that little bit of a dent to the ego. Do we have any questions so far? We don't have any in the chat. Okay. Have... Then, so, uh, like again, this is when we when we when we get into deep discussions and when we're arguing and when we're in this ideation phase or even beyond an ideation phase, just in the day to day operations of a startup or in the back of a jeep traveling or, or around, and you're trying to figure out what's the next best move. Generally speaking, you're going to have to have discussions and you're going to have to have hard discussions, and in these hard discussions. I like to think of it as being in your better and lesser self. For all of us, we all have an inner Einstein. We all have this inner genius that allows us to, to go through and, and just be unique stars, squares, hexagons, whatever it is. We all have this inner Einstein. But life isn't always ideal and life will often be stressful. And when life is stressful, then all of a sudden this other type of personality comes out. This is something that's hidden beneath the surface, this less, lesser self. I call this lesser self the lizard brain. And I try and remind myself of this often. You know, if, I'm, if I haven't eaten in 20 hours or I haven't slept in 20 hours or I'm dehydrated or I'm injured or something, I'm really, I have to really be thinking about it. Okay, am I acting as an intelligent human that I can be? Or am I just being moody and in this aggravated state? The main trick with this, which I'll give you some examples of, of how to get out of it, but the main thing is one, realize if you're acting like a lizard. And two, stop acting like a lizard. So the main thing here is just, just don't be a lizard. But let's, let's dive into this a little bit more. When we are acting as an Einstein, what's actually going on in our brain is we are operating from our prefrontal cortex. In the prefrontal cortex, this is the part of the brain that has evolved most recently and essentially, this is the part of the brain that separates us roughly from the rest of the animal kingdom. It allows us to have complex thoughts and theories and think of the past and the future and all of these, these wonderful things that make us uniquely human. It allows us to problem solve at a very high level. So this is why we want to stay and keep in our inner Einstein state. This is what keeps us cool, calm, and collected. This is, this is when we are cool, calm, and collected, we're in our Einstein state. You know, a lot of people 
who, who get nervous right before giving a presentation, for instance, this is when they get into their lizard mode because they're just so stressed. Uh, fortunate for me, I don't get that when I'm giving a lot of presentations. But if you sit me down in front of an exam, boy, I freeze up and I turn into a lizard instantly. And so my grades have been affected by that all my life. Um, now, on the other side, we've got this lizard. And when you're thinking and acting as a lizard, this is your, your secret service. This is the threat detection center in your brain. It evolved first. It's at the base of our skulls. This is the amygdala. When we're operating out of amygdala, this is, this is when things change. This is when our brain chemistry actually changes. There are different chemicals that are flowing through your brain. You're getting cortisol, you're getting adrenaline, there, your heart rate is increasing, and there's glucose that's being dumped into your bloodstream. When this part of your body takes over, it's saying there is a threat nearby and I'm preparing the body to do whatever it needs to survive. And unfortunately for lizards, despite having these big goofy looking eyes, they don't have good vision. So if this amygdala, amygdala gets triggered in the middle of a conversation, maybe a heated debate on a team, um, then all of a sudden, it, you're no longer talking to Joe on your team or Sally or whomever. Now, all of a sudden, the amygdala, because of bad vision, you're now looking straight at a tiger. In all intents and purposes, this is an evolutionary trait that's built into our source code, into our operating system. And all of a sudden now, uh, we, we don't see people, we see danger, we see a tiger, we see some primordial threat, we see some primal threat that's coming at us. And this makes us quite angry, upset, agitated. And it, it, this is what makes us, to put it in so many words, it makes us dumb. And we don't want to be dumb. So what do we do next when we're in a team? If we're in a team, usually there, maybe there's more than two people, but maybe not. Maybe it is just a team of two, the smallest team. What's actually happening in the beginning of when somebody gets aggravated is there's a, there's a moment where somebody's upset and somebody else is not upset. And because we have mirror neurons, all of a sudden, we always want to become and find equilibrium, whether that's both people upset up here or both people calm, cool, and collected down below. And when, you, when we're in this, this delta, we have to be very cognizant and be aware of seeing somebody who's all of a sudden, you know, nothing on them besides their body language and maybe their tone has changed. It's still the same person, but now they're operating from a different part of their brain. And what are the things that we can do controlling our own body and our own response to things, what are the things that we can do here? For me, the very easiest and the best thing to do is just slow down and breathe. If somebody is visibly upset and I can figure that out, I just sit there and I take a big breath in. Four seconds in, three seconds out. Do this a few times. And just by me doing this, their mirror neurons are somewhat going to be picking up on this that I, you know, maybe they're upset, but if I'm constantly just cool, calm and collected, they're no longer going to be going to be wanting to attack me for a long time. They're going to slowly revert back. Now, maybe it's a huge blow. Maybe it's a huge discussion. You know, the company needs to go with one VC funding versus another, um, or maybe it's a board member, something huge. Um, then, then we really need to think about, okay, the next step that I'll do is I'll actually go out for a walk. I'll take two people and we'll go in totally different directions and actually get the body moving, getting some exercise to kind of flush out that brain chemistry such that we're operating more, um, more freely and, and able to do this. But these are things you can do in the moment. There's other things you can do as well, which are um, journaling, uh, meditating, making sure you get good sleep. These are all really important tasks. So this is the main thing is we really want to make sure that we can bring down that aggravated person in the group and we don't get elevated and aggravated ourselves. Again, this is so easy to say in a, in a presentation and during some slides, to do it in, in person, to do it in practice, it's a whole different story. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes for a breakout session. 
So what we're gonna do is randomly pair you to a breakout room and we're gonna have 10 minutes. Tatevik is going to help me with this because I can't do anything at the moment. Um, and so this will give you five minutes each and I want you to reflect on a time where maybe you there was a teamwork issue or maybe you lost your cool if you weren't thinking and just kind of reflect, uh, what could you have done better? What are some of the techniques you could have used? Well, I have a question regarding to the communication process, right? How do you start? Mm -hmm. uh, you at, at first you describe the problem, then your opinion about that problem in uh, in a team, and then come up with a solution, or you look for the feedback, or how it works for you. Um, oh, people are starting to come back. This is good. That or they just got kicked out of the rooms. One of the two. <laughs> Um, you actually just brought up a question that I want to start the next session with because um, I think it's really important and I think it's really interesting and it's something that I didn't quite mention so far. But is everybody, can you tell if everybody is back in the main room now? Yeah, everybody are back already. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. There's one thing that I, I forgot to mention earlier, and um, Tatev was, was actually bringing it up. And so what's that process of, in the ideation phase, of actually deciding, okay, this is the right person to go to. If, if you have a lot of people in a team and everybody has relatively equal valid opinions or decisions on the thoughts on which way they should go as a team, then what do you do? For me, what I always do and I try and influence on my teams is let's gather data. Data, let's, let's go out for 24 hours, make a quick experiment, validate this, should we go left or should we go right? Should the app be orange or should the app be blue? We don't know, but really going back and validating and going through and getting our egos out of it and just saying, let's gather information and see what the, our customers, potential customers have to say create a website, um, do anything like this, just what are, find a paper, find a book, find an article, find a podcast, something that supports your idea. And then you come back together and you now you have this hopefully intellectual conversation about what data did you all find within the last hour or maybe it's 24 hours or maybe it's a week, depending upon your, your hit rate of working with your team. Um, that is, that's something that I usually work with. So, we are getting a little bit short on time, but I'm gonna try and power through the rest of this. So I hope everyone can hold on for the next like 10 minutes and I will power through some quick slides. <laughs> so the first tool that I like to use is actually something that's called the Team Canvas. This is something that's super common at Unternehmertum. Um, this is for me just, it's an orient, it's a, it's a map for a team. You know, when you have all of these different people, you, even if you meet them, you don't know what their capabilities are, what their network is. So when, if I'm working with a team for a short amount of time, then I'm looking at the edges and I'm just looking at the day-to-day. -day. You know, I don't, I don't care about the values, the common goals, whatever. If it's a short amount of time and it's for work, maybe it's a two week sprint, who cares? What can you do? What can you do? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? Let's be a little more tactical in how we go about things, be specific. Now, if this is a long term for like a startup or uh, a team in, in your office that you're working with day in and day out, this is when you really want to start thinking about the long term stuff. Common goals, the values, the needs, the expectations, the purpose, the purpose that I talked about earlier, um, and these personal goals. And what I always do when I'm giving these out to the teams that I'm coaching is I make sure that they fill out their personal goals individually before they share them with the group because we have a confirmation bias. We have these mirror neurons and we wanna, we wanna be accepted by the tribe, by the community that we come from. But by having us write them individually and then having to say them and be vulnerable, these are planting the seeds of trust by being vulnerable, by, uh, by presenting our, our honest opinion. The next thing that I like to think about in terms of, uh, of like conflict management is actually just a kind of a, a state of mind and it's, I call it minding my angle. So if I have a problem with somebody, I don't frame it as I have a problem with somebody. I have a problem with somebody's actions. If I have a problem with 
somebody's idea. It's not with that person. I have a problem with their idea. So, but if things get heated and it becomes slightly more direct, all of a sudden this angle starts, starts to fade away and it's no longer an angle. Now all of a sudden we are head to head and now we just have two lizards in a battle and that's maybe entertaining, but it's not productive. When we're both in this lizard brain, it's not, it's not good. We have to really keep an eye on this angle. Once, the, once that lizard goes away, now we can have a conversation. So if I have somebody that I'm on a team with and I've been working with for a long time, I like to use the trick of um, see, feel, wish. See, feel, wish. I see you doing this thing over here, this action. It makes me feel this way. I wish you would do something else instead. That way I'm addressing what's going on. It's not personal. It's just something that they can change hopefully. And then it makes me feel so I'm being vulnerable saying I'm feeling I don't like this anymore. And then you're giving constructive feedback. This is a way to circumnavigate that lizard brain and we can have difficult conversations, have cognitive conflict about ideas and actions and not have to really um, trigger that, that emotional lizard that we all have in our brains. We mind that angle. Then the, the other two workarounds that I really like that I've read about in literature and I've tried as well is the first one is called a pre-mortem. Pre-mortem, we hop in our time machine and before we fully execute on a plan, we hop in a time machine, it's one year from now or whatever your time cycle is, maybe it's six months from now. And you say, okay, the project failed. Why did it fail? Lizards, even though they're kind of dumb, they can still see that this is an exercise being done in a fantasy world. Time machines don't exist. Even lizards know that. So all of a sudden that lizard brain is standing down, he's like, no, oh, this is fine. Even though they're saying harsh things, it doesn't matter because this, is, this isn't real. We're in the fantasy world. Furthermore, what I like to do is play the devil's advocate. Meaning if I say, hey, I'm playing this role, I'm dressing up as somebody who's gonna be mean, but wink, wink, it's actually me, don't worry. This way I can give harsh criticism. I can say, well, if you play the devil's advocate, I think this is gonna be a bad idea because blah, 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 blah. I'm playing a role and then egos are protected. You can have, you can do this, this kind of social dance that, that dances around our human biology and allows us to push forward and stay in that prefrontal cortex, stay as an inner Einstein and stay with that higher level thinking. Next, what I'm gonna talk about is the last part of the, the talk. And this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, first time I really went and traveled abroad for a long period of time. And I went uh, with a student group when I was a student, uh, engineering student and uh, we went to Nepal and um, we were building a water filtration system for a hospital. This was a five year long student project. And when we arrived at this, at this location, all of a sudden um, our build site that we had been building on for years, there was about two to three more meters of soil on the dirt or on, on our build site. And for construction reasons, we had to dig that out and we couldn't get cattle in there to move things out. We couldn't get machinery for student group. We don't have that kind of money. So what did we have to do? We did what the Nepalis did and we would dig. And if you can see this here, when we were digging, the way the Nepali people do it is they have a shoveler and they have a roper. This is a photo that um, my main roper is actually taking the photo. Her name is Marika. And we were trying to build a septic tank a big giant tank to hold black water and settle our contaminants. When we got there, we realized that this was a giant tank and we had to dig through an insane amount of soil to, before we could even start building. So for four weeks, Marika, my roper and myself and also Taylor, we were digging. We were digging. We woke up, we dug. When we went down, we had lunch. Uh, then we would dig and then we'd go back. We, I mean, we just, we were just digging. I mean, literally we were digging ourselves into a hole. Um, and if you want to know what it looks like for a couple of weeks of digging, uh, this is kind of what we accomplished before our mentors told us that we had to, guess what? We had to dig some more. And this is when I was upset. Um, 
this is when I realized I was kind of falling into a weird depression. I was, I was getting into this being constantly upset. And I realized after talking to Marika, my roper, I, I, I was always focused on the next pile of dirt that I had to throw out of a hole, always focused on the next pile of dirt. But my roper, Marika, she was always happy and I could not figure it out. After talking, we realized all I did every day for hour, eight hours a day roughly, was looking at a pile of dirt. Just looking at the next thing I needed to move. And all she looked at was all the progress you made. So she was just super happy and having a good time. And during this time, once we realized this, we really realized the power of perspective. She told me the story that I will never forget. It's the power of perspective. She told me the story of this person walking down the street and there's three builders. The first builder, she asks the person, what are you doing? And the builder says, I'm, I'm laying bricks and putting them down. She says, okay, and walks on to the next builder. What are you doing? I'm building a wall. Interesting enough. She goes to the third builder, says, what are you doing? I'm building a cathedral. So by really taking in that perspective, you can see how you can get stuck into, on a startup, I'm laying bricks or I'm building a wall. But it's so important for us, whether it's a coach, a manager, or just some role on the team to take the big perspective. Even if that perspective is just peeking over that wall and just looking over the horizon a few meters or so, a few days outside, being able to get our heads out of the trenches, so to speak, and see where we're actually going and making sure we're on track. You know, this is the power perspective. And I really think that there should be at least one person on the team who's responsible um, for keeping this uh, this, this perspective. So this is my talk. Thank you all. Um, I did a lot of talking. I apologize. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, this is the QR code for my LinkedIn. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Um, but at that point, uh, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And I'll be on for a little bit longer if you have any questions, uh, but I, I'll, I'll end it here in case people want to jump off for the next session.